Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> look at just a few verses here, but um, you're probably familiar with the fact that teachers understand the importance of, of good illustrations, good examples. How many have ever had the teacher say, or, or maybe you asked a teacher, uh, could you explain that? You ever had them ever, ever ask a teacher to do that? Could you explain that? What's that like? And so on. And uh, of course, they are Probably well, good teachers anyway can do that, right? They can give you good examples, uh, maybe real world examples, examples that are beneficial to you to uh, understand new material. And we probably all heard this phrase. You fill in the blank for me. A picture is worth a thousand words, okay? And a good illustration or example is just as valuable, isn't it? Because it gives you a word picture, kind of gives you a, a picture in your mind, something that your mind's eye sees and can help you better understand uh, those particular principles. Um, name, name for me the greatest teacher ever. Who would it be? Jesus, okay. And if you're familiar with the Gospels, you know that he used a lot of illustrations, didn't he? He used a lot of illustrations during his ministry to convey spiritual truth. Uh, some of them uh, started with, behold the fowls of the air, or consider the lilies of the field. Or maybe uh, you're familiar with a sower that went forth to sow. And other illustrations, and when it comes to conveying spiritual um, information and spiritual material, although I trust it's not new. Um, there's a lot of illustration, a lot of people that are illustrations of what I want us to look at this morning of faith. Uh, when it comes to faith, one of the people that is put forth as a good example, and you think about this, you think about people that are good examples um, that maybe your kids, you know, you tell your kids, hey, uh, you, you know, if you're picking, picking a hero, picking somebody to be like, uh, you know, years ago, I guess there was a, uh, a song actually that was about Michael Jordan and uh, how everybody wanted to be like Mike. Okay, all the aspiring little basketball players wanted to be like him. And uh, I, I know that there are uh, some folks, you know, in my golfing history that wanted to emulate a particular player. Uh, and it's not just golf or basketball. It could be a lot of different uh, vocations as well. That people want to be like, people want to emulate uh, different people. And, um, you know, from uh, any particular vocation, life's work, uh, principle, life principle, anything like that, sometimes it's good for us to have a good illustration, somebody that we can look at, we can examine their lives and get an idea of how they did whatever it is we're looking at. And I want us to look at a good example of faith and the person brought forth in it uh, of Abraham. He is, after all, and considered the father of those who trust the Lord. He is considered in Romans chapter 4, uh, the father of all that believe, okay? He is the uh, kind of the, the example, the number one example there. And I know in Hebrews chapter 11, there are a lot of other people. But I want us to focus on Abraham and what we can learn as we look at the, fa the faith of Father Abraham. Because his faith illustrates several principles that if we're going to emulate him, if we're going to be like him, if we're going to illustrate to others uh, what it means to be faithful, to have faith, to trust the Lord, to put our reliance on the Lord, we certainly need to know uh, these truths. And I want to preach a message to you that I have entitled, The Faith of Father Abraham. 
what is it? What kind of faith is it? And certainly in these, as we're learning on Wednesdays, these perilous times, uh, Paul told Timothy about these perilous times. No, he said, no, in the latter days that perilous times will come. Those hard to bear, hard to deal with times. We've been learning about that. And I want us to kind of um, look at what the writer of the book of Hebrews has to say about Abraham's faith. I want to start with verse number eight. Notice, if you will, in Hebrews eleven eight, 8, it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as, a, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which, was, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Skip down to verse number 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word now. And we would ask Lord that you would Help us to focus our attention upon these principles from the life of Abraham. He is certainly a good example, a good illustration, a good picture of someone who put their trust, their faith, their reliance, their dependence on thee. And in these perilous times, these last days, we would ask that you would help us to emulate Abraham in our faith. Help us, Lord, to illustrate it to others. Help us to illustrate it to the generations to come, our children, our grandchildren, those who we come in contact with through social media or in the workplace or uh, somewhere uh, outside, Lord, even in the grocery store. Help us to to convey to them what it means to have faith. We pray for the children that their time would be profitable. We ask the same for ourselves, and we pray that you would remove any of the distractions that have come our way. Help us to focus our attention upon your word, and we'll thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. So the faith of Abraham, what makes him such a good illustration, a good picture, a good example of it? Now, granted, um, let's ask this question. Was Abraham perfect? Was he sinless? No. Did he make mistakes? Sure he did. Uh, but he's still called the friend of God. He had a very unique relationship with the Lord. And um, again, in Romans chapter 4, Paul mentions him and says that he is the father of all that believe. The word believe, or, or all that believe, that phrase could also be translated to faithful. Those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ and in, the, in God the Father. Now, I want you to notice something about his faith. His faith illustrates something very important for us to understand. Go back to verse number eight. If you'll notice there, it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, okay, to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, okay? He was called. Now, that particular word called comes from a root word in the original Greek language, which means to be invited. How many have ever gotten an invitation to any anything? Yep. Okay, we probably all have a birthday party, anniversary party, baby shower, you know, whatever it is, some special occasion, we get an invitation, and you look at it, and you go, wow, that's really cool, and somebody says, what is it? Well, so-and-so is going to have this whatever, and uh, you put it on your calendar, and you put that thing up there so you don't forget, and whatnot, and uh, think about invitations, what can you do with an invitation? What do you do with them? If somebody invites you to a birthday party, what can you, what are your options? Okay, you RSVP, and those are very important. You know, please let us know. All right. Uh, that's the English for uh, respondus 
Cebu play or something, I forget. Anyway, uh, RSVP, that's why we, we use the, the, the letters and not the actual phrase, right? Because it's French, all right? But you can RSVP, and if and those things are important. I was reading an illustration of a lady who was a, a world-renowned opera singer, okay? She traveled the world singing and, and so on, and there was a couple getting married who asked her to sing at their wedding. And this was not just like, you know, quote, unquote, normal people like us, okay? This was a very influential um, couple, influential family and so on. They invited her to come and they sent the invitation that had an RSVP, all right? She took it for granted that since she was part of the ceremony that she could go to the, uh, the, re the reception, which was very posh, very expensive, and in another part of the building from whence the ceremony took place. So she and her husband go and she sings and everybody departs to go to the reception dinner and so on. And when they get to the top of this very uh, large staircase in this very opulent hotel, there's a man with a clipboard in a tux who says, name please. And she says, well, I'm so-and-so. And he runs down through and he says, I'm sorry, ma'am, your name is not on the list. And it was then that she remembered, not only did she get the invitation, but there was an RSVP. And she took it for granted that since she was singing at the ceremony, had this particular part in the ceremony that she would be allowed into the reception dinner. Of course, everybody is stacked up on the staircase wondering why, what's the holdup? Can you imagine her embarrassment as she and her husband turned and walked back down that staircase and out of the building? She said, I, rem I, I never forgot that and I will never, when I am invited to something, I will never forget the RSVP to make contact with them and let them know but that is an, ex okay, I'm accepting your invitation, right? You can accept that invitation or what else can you do about it? You can reject it, right? Now, the Bible says that Abraham was called, okay? He was invited to come out unto a land that he didn't know anything about. What could he have done? He could have said, no, thanks. I like it right here in Ur of the Chaldees. My family's here. We've been here for generations. I like that. And I, I'm, I'm not going to move. And undoubtedly, God would have found somebody else. But that faith that is illustrated here is a faith that hears. When he was called, he heard that call and he obeyed that call. Both of which, and both of these things, uh, the, the word actually means invited or summoned. When you're summoned to something, okay, can you, let's just suppose for whatever reason, you get summoned to court, won't be tomorrow because it's uh, a holiday, but on Tuesday, something comes in the mail, um, it's got your name on it, it comes from the, it's from the city of Marietta, and there is a summons, you have to be at court on this particular day, on this particular time. What can you do with summons? You can accept it or reject it, right? I'm not going, all right? How many people get arrested because they didn't show up to court, right? They, yeah, they get a bench warrant and they say, okay, and you they find you someplace and they, you say, what's this all about? Well, failure to appear. Okay, but Abraham didn't do that. We can, when God calls, when God invites us, when God summons us to follow him, what are our options? Just like Abraham, we can accept it or reject it. Now you have to understand something. If you reject it, you do so at your own peril. 
right? How many times have people sat in a service not unlike this, and at the close of it, you know what? What what generally comes at the close of um, an independent fundamental Baptist church service? What do we call it? It's an invitation. All right. How many of us have ever been, well, you're all sitting here in one of those, but we sat in those in the past, and maybe it is that the Lord has impressed upon your heart, you need to go get that taken care of. But how many of us, it, not unlike myself, when I was small and understood at the invitation of a special meeting, my need of salvation, the invitation was given I knew that I needed to be saved. I knew that I needed to go down and get saved and talk to somebody about that. But you know what I did? I rejected it for a period of time. And you talk about being miserable for a period of time. Wow. Because I knew if I died at that particular time, I was not going to go to heaven. I eventually went and settled the issue. But you can accept an invitation or reject it. You can accept a summons or reject it. But what did Abraham do? Well, we'll get to that here in just a second, but I want you to notice something about this particular hearing, okay? What is there a difference between hearing and listening? How many of us have had our children and we ask them, did you hear what I just said? The answer to the question is absolutely. I heard what you said. Were you listening to what I said? That's the difference, right? It's my understanding that, and I don't know how they would, would gauge this, but I have heard it said by scientists who, who dabble in these kind of things that everything from birth to death that you hear is imprinted on your brain. Everything you see, everything you hear is imprinted on your brain somewhere. And that's just a matter of, okay, can I pull it up if I need it, right? But I want to give you another some other illustrations here of hearing this faith that hears. Turn, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 19. Back in the Old Testament to 1 Kings. First Kings 19. This is the chapter that has in it the 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 story of Elijah and this and in a couple previous chapters and of course this the contest on Mount Carmel in uh, chapter 18 leads to Jezebel who was the queen at that time uh, to threaten Elijah and of course Elijah if you read through it you know that he runs uh, from this uh, particular threat and so forth. And it says in verse number nine, in first Kings 19, it says, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, what doest thou here, Eli Elijah? And he said, Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with a sword, with a sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he, God said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. You know, God still talks that way today. He could. I, I've had um, one lady ask me, she said, Pastor, what should I do? I wish God would just tell me what he wants me to do. If he could, if he would write it in the stars, I'm sure I'd get it. I mean, you could, how amazing would that be, right? If you walk outside one day or one evening on a starry night and look up in the sky and all of the stars start to move and you get this, you, you know, your, your name there. Hey, Don, 
you know, and whatever it is. And on the, 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 the end of that it says sign God. Okay. How, I mean, you would probably get the message. Would you, you would probably say, I'm, I, you know, I don't know. Could your camera pick that up on your phone? Would that be possible? I don't know if it would be possible to do that, but you might try and take a picture of it just so everybody would see it and everybody would know. But if God did that and he still could do that, but he doesn't generally do that even today, how does he speak? It's a still small voice. He speaks to us through his word. Okay. And one of the reasons we don't know what God wants us to do, we're not accepting those invitations and those summons to follow the Lord like Abraham did. What, one of the reasons we don't do that is because we don't know what God wants. We don't know what God says because we're not reading his word. Isaiah came into the same kind of understanding when he heard the voice of the Lord say, whom shall I send and who will go for us? He heard that voice and he answered it. What did he say? He said, here am I, send me. Abraham heard this particular still small voice. And my question to you this morning is if his faith illustrates a faith that hears, what is your faith? Does your, is your faith hearing what God says? Are you listening to what God says? Samuel, as a small child, was ministering to Eli, who was at that time the, the high priest in Israel. And God spoke to this child, Samuel, uh, three different times. He thought it was, was Eli and ran in to see Eli. You know, he said, you know, here, I'm, here am I. You called. Here am I. Uh, what do you need? Uh, how can I help you? And so forth. And, and Eli said, I didn't call you. Go lay down. Happened again. Same kind of thing. Eli says, go lay down. Third time it happens. Eli's perceptive enough. And see, that kind of happens to us today, doesn't it? Sometimes God speaks and we don't, we don't hear it. We're not listening. We don't get it. We don't think that that's really what the Lord might be doing. We disregard it. We don't accept the invitation or the summons. We go on our own way. And then maybe God says again and again and again, and we finally get it. That's what happened to Eli. And Eli told Samuel, he said, the next time you hear this voice say, speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. That ought to be our mindset. But you have to be very, very conscious, don't you, of the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. I was thinking about this recently and I missed an opportunity. The Lord impressed upon my heart out of nowhere. This particular person that I've known for years is a member of our church. Hadn't heard from her in several years because she moved away. And I even told my wife, I'm thinking about calling Judy, Judy Lynch. She said, why? I said, because we haven't talked to her in a while. Got busy, let it slide. Then a week or so ago, as a matter of fact, um, a week ago today, Judy Lynch went home to be with the Lord couple weeks prior to that, I had a still small voice say, call Judy Lynch. And I missed it. I didn't accept the summons or the invitation. Shame on me. But how many times do we do that? And the reason we don't do that is because it's not because we're not hearing, right? It's not be it's because we're not listening. We're not as attentive as we should be. Well, let's go a little further back to Hebrews chapter 11. Notice what it says there again in verse number eight. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, skip down to the middle of the verse, it says, obeyed. 
It's one thing to hear it, right? And, and we have that conversation with our kids. Did you hear what I just said? Yes. Well, why didn't you whatever? Why didn't you do what I told you? Oh, I didn't know that you were serious. Okay. I just like to hear myself talk. And that's why I was talking to you. That's why I happen to mention, go clean your room, take the trash out, feed the dog, whatever it is, okay? I didn't know you were serious. Well, God is serious when he speaks, even that still small voice, which we need to listen to, we need to hear, we need to be perceptive as Abraham was, but it says there that he obeyed. And his faith illustrates a faith that obeys even when it can't see. That's really what faith is, isn't it? Of following the Lord wherever, whenever, however, for whatever reason, even though we can't see. Now, that's, that is where the rubber meets the road as far as faith is concerned, isn't it? Because... We've not seen God, right? But God is still alive. God is still sovereign. He's still on the throne. He's still aware of every circumstance that we come in contact with. And when God says, I want you to, and you fill in the blank, what should we automatically do? We should automatically do that. But sometimes not knowing where you're going well, it's not sometimes, right? Every time, not knowing where you're going, as one preacher said, will always test and stretch your faith. God says, this is what I want you to do. And you look at it and you go, wow. And instead of being like Abraham who obeyed, instead of being like that small child Samuel who said, speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. I'm here and I heard you. What do you want me to do? What do we do? Well, we walk by sight a lot of times and not by faith, right? Even though the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 said we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, answer this question for me. Is what we're talking about that faith that obeys even when it can't see is that blind faith? Is that blind faith? When we obey, we follow the Lord, even though we can't see. Is that blind faith? Okay, I have a no. Do I have a yes? Do I have a maybe? Do I have a, we're not sure. I'm not sure, maybe no, possibly, sort of, kind of, okay. It's yes and no. And you go, what? How can that be? That's got to be an oxymoron, right? How can it be both things at the same time? It is in a matter of speaking. I don't know what God's going to do, but he does, right? And I know from past experience, and hopefully you are this way, from past experience that anytime God said, I want you to do, and you fill in the blank, I want you to go, and you fill in the blank, I want you to say, whatever it is, you have an experiential knowledge of the fact that God knows what's best and always does what's right and best for me. And you can say, even though I cannot see, I can still trust and I can still have faith. But it obeys even when you can't see because we live by faith and not by sight. It will test and it will stretch your faith. Trust me, you know that you've been there, right? I, and o, Abraham obeyed even though he didn't know where he was going. Because if you notice the verse here, verse number eight, the last phrase of verse number eight in Hebrews chapter 11 says, not knowing whither he went. He had no idea where God was going to take him. 
But what did he do? He obeyed. He didn't know not only where God was taking him, but how God was going to fulfill the promise that he gave him. How are we going to do How How is it possible that one, a 75-year-old man and his 71 or so year old wife are going to have children? And not just one child, but eventually to to outnumber the stars in the heavens and the sand on the sea. How is that possible? He didn't know that, but he still obeyed. He didn't know when God was going to do that, but he still obeyed. He didn't know why he should follow the Lord, but what did he do? He still obeyed. And again, those tests will stretch your faith. Now, I want us to look at some strange tests of faith just as another illustration of the point, okay? Hold your finger in Hebrews and turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Moses is dead. Joshua is the, the, the leader of the children of Israel. They're about ready to go across the Jordan River into the promised land and take control of what God had promised them, okay? I want you to notice Joshua 6. Let's look at verse number 1. It says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Now notice what he says. Ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. The seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priest shall blow with the trumpets, and it shall come to pass that when they make a loud blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now notice verse number 14. It says, in the second day, they compassed the city once and returned unto the camp, so they did six days. Okay, you, you understand the story. You're familiar with the story, right? Uh, you remember hearing about it in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and so forth. All right. Now, answer this question. How were fortified cities back in this day conquered? What was the, 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 the mode of conquering, overcoming the fortifications of a city? What did they do? Well, they laid siege to it, okay, which means that they surrounded it, okay, Uh, cut off the water, cut off the food supply, right, and just waited everybody out. That's not what happened here. God said, compass the city once, nobody talks, okay, now how hard would it be to get over I think somewhere uh, over 650,000 men, because that was the size of the standing army at that time, okay? 650,000 men to walk around the city one time and nobody says a word. Is that hard? Sure it is. Because everybody's thinking, and we got to walk clear out there. And we got to get all of us go around the city. How long is it going to take us? And it wasn't very pleasant, I'm sure. And they did it. And they walked back to to camp. And Joshua says, dismissed. And they go about their business. Day number two, they show up. They muster all 650,000 plus men. And they go around the city. One time, they did this for six days. How long do you think it would take before those guys, all 650,000 plus of them, to start talking about it while they were marching around the city? Well, here we go again. Day number four. Day number five. Day number six. Oh, man, this is going to be horrible. Day number seven, you know what we got to do now? 
We're not walking once. We're going seven times around this place. This is going to take all day. I mean, this is why. Hey, Joshua. Why are we doing this again? This makes no sense. Well, what happened? This test. What happened? You've read the story. You know what happens. There was a great victory, right? Let's go a little further. Judges chapter 7. Past Joshua to Judges chapter 7. By this time in Israel's story, they have gotten uh, disobedient to the Lord. They're not following the Lord. They're not listening to the Lord. They're probably not even hearing what God says anymore. And it says in verse number 1 of Judges 7, Then Jeroboam, which is who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early, pitched beside the well Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill, by the hill Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into thine hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. Okay? What would that do for you if you're Gideon and you're in charge of this deliverance of the Lord and you make this announcement? Well, you hear, you listen to what God says. And um, God says, uh, tell you what I want you to do. Let anybody that is afraid, has reservations or whatever, to go back home. Now, it took a whole lot of faith for Gideon, I dare say, to make that announcement, don't you think? Because he had 32,000 guys and the Midianites were as the sands of the sea. He needs as big a group as he can get. And now he makes this announcement, and what happens? Two-thirds of the group say, thanks, we'll pray for you later, and they leave. So now he's got 10,000. I can imagine he's kind of bolster himself up a little bit and say, well, you know, that's not too bad. I think we can still do it. You know, we'll just fight like wild men and, 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 you, you know, each one of us, I mean, if we're, if we're outnumbered, uh, you, you know, 20 to one, I think we can still handle it. But notice the rest as we continue reading. It says, and the Lord said unto Gideon, verse number four, the people are yet too many. What? You just cut our force by two thirds. We got a third as many people as we started with, and they're still too many. Bring them down under the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. Here's another test, right? This shall go with thee, the same shall go, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lap, basically when they got down on their knees and just stuck their face in the water, okay? All of those people are not going with us. Thou shalt set by thyself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting putting their hand to their mouth, okay? They sat there and they drew the water up with their hand. They were paying attention to what was going on around them and stuff like that. They were not just totally consumed on getting a drink and that kind of thing. He says, and the number, uh, number of, the, of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth were 300. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, will I save you? We went from 32,000 down to 300. Tell me how that makes sense. If you look at it from a human standpoint, that is the most ridiculous thing, along with marching around the city once for six days and then seven on the seventh day, right? Was it a test of faith? Surely it was. 
Let's go a little further. First Kings chapter 17. First Kings 17. First Kings 17. It says, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, that took a whole lot of faith to do that to begin with, to go tell this despot of a king, Ahab, who was known for being very ruthless and cutting people's heads off just because. All right? Hey, guess what? There's not going to be any rain in this nation till I say so says, um, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Okay, wait a minute. You're going to do what? I mean, I got the, the brook part. Yeah, that, that's probably a good source of water. I got that, but... You, I got to I got to depend on birds to feed me. Okay, Lord, I really hope you know what you're doing. Verse number 5 says, so he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. Is that obeying even though he can't see? Sure it is. And he went out and dwelt by the brook that is before Jordan and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. And behold, I have commanded a widow woman uh, there to sustain thee. Okay? A widow woman. What's a widow woman got? Nothing. I'll not read down through the rest of the story. For sake of time, I think you're familiar with it. But there are actually two tests here. Well, there's more than that, but two people that are involved. Elijah and the widow woman. Because Elijah says to her, because she's making a couple, she's putting a couple sticks together and so forth. We're going to have these and we're going to make this little meal uh, of, of a cake and that kind of thing. Then my son and I, were going to die. And Elijah says, um, well, go, go do that, but you fix me something first. Does that make sense to her? No, because it diminishes my supply, right? What am I going to do? What am I, how am I going to feed my son, right? You're familiar with the story. You know what happened, right? But anytime God says, I want you to do this, one, we have the option to accept or reject it and if we do decide to follow the Lord, that's going to test and stretch our faith, isn't it? He's going to put us in a place where we can't do anything about it. And it stretches our faith. All of these tests, and you can add 2 Kings chapter 4 uh, to this list. We'll not take time to look at it. But none of these tests made sense, did they? You look at going around Jericho. You look at following the Lord to a brook that eventually dried up and trusting birds to feed you. And then a widow woman who probably maybe she had, you know, in a matter of speaking, she had less than birds, right? And when we're faced with these, beloved, what should our response be? If we're going to have a faith like Abraham, if we're going to illustrate it to the, to the generations to come, what kind of faith do we need to have? We need to be listening, but we also need to be obeying, don't we? We need to obey the Lord. James has something to, do, to say about difficult circumstances. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Look at James chapter 1, maybe just a page over from where we are. He says there in James chapter 1, 
in verse 1, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. We, I think we had a study on James years ago. Why, was, why were the 12 tribes scattered abroad? Do you remember? Because of persecution. Would that try your faith? Probably. He says, my brethren, okay, now this doesn't make sense either. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials. Many very variegated, many colored, many faceted problems and trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. We love that word, don't we? Patience. Just be patient. Stay with me. Just be patient, right? Because we get impatient, okay? It's not my fault. I come from a long line of impatient people, all right? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm learning, all right? Don't ask my wife about it. She'll tell you. So that would be one of the most impatient people I know in the face of this planet. I'm telling you what, it's just like, oh, wow. Okay. I'm trying to get better at it. I really am. I admit it. Confession is good for the soul. But when trials come, when God allows them, God leads you into them. What should be the response? Okay, Lord, I heard what you said. I was listening and I'm going to follow. I'm going to obey because I have a long history. I have experiential knowledge of the fact that every time you led me into a difficulty, a problem, a temptation, a, a test of my faith to stretch me, what's the benefit of those hard tests anyway? I mean, you think about it physically, okay? How do people, how does a muscle get stronger? You have to use it, but then you have to tax it, right? You have to, you have to strain it to some degree, right? You have to add some weight to the bar, right? You have to, to run a little harder or run a little faster, Okay, you have to put some pressure on your cardiovascular system and your muscular, skeletal muscular system and that kind of thing, right? In order to make it stronger, okay? Now, I don't know how many of you ladies, uh, my sister was just diagnosed with this, um, have, she has osteoporosis. You know what osteoporosis is? Okay, it is a, it is a weakening of, of, the, the, of the bones, okay? Um, do you have any idea what one of the, the, the ways to strengthen the, um, the bone density if you have osteoporosis is weight bearing. Did you know that weight bearing? Now you have to be careful. Okay. Because as your bones get thinner, they also get frailer and you don't want to overtax your muscles you know, you don't, you don't want to grab that 500 pound gorilla in the middle of the, of the room and hoist him on your shoulder and see if you can walk, you know, across the living room with him. Okay. What's probably going to happen is you're going to break something. So you have to be careful when you do that, but even just walking across the living room, walking when you're bearing weight can benefit you. Okay. Now, spiritually speaking, What's the benefit? How do we benefit? How do we make our faith muscle, our, our faith bones, in a matter of speaking, stronger? You have to add pressure to them. And how does the pressure come? The pressure comes with stress. Isn't that wonderful? It comes from tests, right? It comes from us listening to the Lord and the Lord saying, I want you to do this. And when we do that, we find out that our faith is, is bolstered, it's emboldened, and it's made strong so that the next time some test comes, we look at it and we go, that's not hard. I can do that. Well, how do you know? Because I've done this, which was a whole lot harder. Oh, okay. So what do we do? James says that we count it all joy. When we fall into these things, when God leads us into, as we sang that song, when God leads his dear children along, what do we do? We respond like we should. Abraham did that. He illustrates it for us. And that 
that faith that hears and that faith that obeys will always be stronger than the faith that doesn't hear and doesn't obey. Well, you have the option. It's up to you. You can reject it. You can accept it. What's the last thing we want to talk about? Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse number nine. It says, by faith, Abraham, verse number eight, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. He went out, he didn't even, he, he couldn't even see where he was going, why he was going, how he was going to get there or anything. It says, verse number nine, by, by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse number, uh, verse number 13 there says, these all died in faith not having received the promises of that land of their own to, in which to live, in which to, uh, to prosper, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, these promises, and embraced them and confessed that they were, notice, strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What's the closing point I want to make here? Abraham's faith illustrates a faith that hears, a faith that listens, a faith that obeys, and a faith that holds loosely to this world. Too often, one of the reasons why we don't hear what God is saying, one, we haven't read what he said. Number two, we're not perceptive enough to understand that still small voice. When God puts a, prompts you, you know, puts something in your heart, how many have ever had that happen? God just laid it on your heart. God just laid it on my heart too, and you fill in the blank. We probably all, if you've been a Christian long enough, you probably had that happen to you. But you have to also understand this. One of the things that Abraham's faith illustrates for us, how many buildings did, did Abraham build? Do you remember? We did a study on Abraham back in the first of the last year. How many buildings did he build? Zero. How many houses did he own? Zero. What did he live in? A tent. A tent. He lived in a tent. But all that the world can offer me, what's going to eventually happen to it? I have a friend of mine. He's, he's, in the, he's an evangelist. Some of you have heard Kevin Brownfield before. He used to play this game with his children as they were in evangelism. They would take their... 35 or 40 foot trailer and their, you know, extended cab and extended bed truck and travel all over the country. And periodically they would go and, and they would, wherever they happen to be, they would try to find the nicest neighborhoods. Uh, and they would just drive down the, you know, drive through the neighborhood and look at all the neat houses and the big houses and stuff like that. And, and, and all the kids would say, Ooh, I like that house. If I could buy a house, I want a house like that. You ever done that? You ever drive through town, just look at the, you know, maybe it was at Christmas time, you drove through town, or you went someplace and you looked at the lights and see how all the big houses are decorated and, and all those kind of things. And I've known uh, some, some locales, they even have people, you know, you can do that. People can actually, op they will open their home up for you to come during the holidays and see how they decorated it and different stuff like that. And everybody's, wow, ooh, I want one of those boy, I wish I had a house like this and all that other stuff. And, 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 and Kevin Brownfield would tell his kids, it's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. Isn't that horrible to dash a child's, you know, hope and dream? There's method to that. You see, everything that we have in this, in this life, what's eventually going to happen to it? It's all going to burn up. We can't take it with us, can we? Now I've heard stories, I've read illustrations of people that were very, very wealthy or they had a possession. You know, I've heard of guys that were, you know, they were buried in their favorite car. Seems like a really big waste to me, but hey, that's what they did. People are, you know, buried with their possessions and stuff like that. We have to understand that we're strangers. We're pilgrims. This world is not my home i'm just passing through 
The word strangers in verse number 13, this is an interesting word. It is the Greek word xenoi. Xenoi means aliens. Did you know that aliens were mentioned in the Bible? Now you do. It means aliens, okay? Kind of like this. People that come across our border, whether north or south, southern border, we hear about that, okay? What are they? They break into this country. They come across illegally. What are they? They call them illegal immigrants, right? Because alien is just a little bit too, that's a little hard, right? Okay. But that's the idea, all right? And, and an illegal alien doesn't belong in that country, right? Are you aware of the fact that we are strangers? We're aliens. We don't belong in this country. We're here for just a short period of time. What we have is going to be left behind. And if the Lord tarries, eventually it's all going to burn up, right? So what should we look for? Notice the last part of um, verse number 10 it says, and, and, and the, the, the whole reason why Abraham was able to do what he did from a faith standpoint, he listened, he heard, he obeyed, and he held loosely to the things of this world. Why? Because verse number 10 says, he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Some of these days, those of us that know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, where are we going to wake up? Where are we going? We're going home. My home, again, is not this world. As much as I like what I have, as much as I love the people that are sitting here and online with us and I have in my family and friends and so forth and so on, as much as I love that, this World is not my home. I'm just passing through. And my faith needs to listen to what God says, obey what he says, and hold loosely to the things that he's given me in this life. Because what's more important? I've asked the question years ago. Maybe you've heard me say it here. As your pastor before, there's two things that will last forever. Besides the Lord, two things. The word of God liveth and abideth forever. And the souls of men, those two things. Sometimes, though, I think and, and we think the way we live, that my house or my car or my whatever is going to last forever, right? But that's not going to happen. And my faith needs to illustrate to the generations to come what Abraham's faith illustrated to us, to listen. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you obeying? Are you going and doing and saying what God says and wants? Do you understand that the most important thing is yet to come? And we ought to be sending that treasure on ahead, right? The faith of Father Abraham illustrates some wonderful principles for us, and we need to incorporate them into our lives so that we too may be good illustrations of what it means to believe. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we had to look into your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us as your people to trust you. Help us, Lord, to hear when you speak, to listen and obey what you say. That little song that we sing in junior church and 
Vacation Bible School, trust and obey, for there's no better way, no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Help us to do that. Help us as we, we look at this illustration, this picture of faith from Abraham. Help us to incorporate in our lives these principles that we too might illustrate for others what it means to have faith 